This is Michael Matheson Miller, and you are listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. Thank you again for listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. I'm delighted to have as my guest, Dr. Philip Ovedia. Uh, he is a heart surgeon, and we're going to talk about his book, Stay Off My Operating Table. Uh, so show notes you can find at themoralimagination.com. Also, if you like the podcast, please do give it a five-star review at Apple Podcasts. Thanks to all those who supported me, Patreon, and thanks to those who have written reviews. And also, I have a newsletter that I send out about twice a month uh, where I'll have links to podcasts, links to some essays I've written, and then usually a short essay on something. So one of them is on the social nature of the person and another one coming out soon, Augusto del Noche's analysis of the shift from bourge pure bourgeois or Christian bourgeois to pure bourgeois and what that means. So uh, sign up for that at themoralimagination.com. So I'm delighted to have as my guest, Dr. Philip Ovedia. And, you know, I often do, listeners know, I often do philosophy of the person, technology, et cetera, but I've done a couple of episodes on medicine, I've done two with neurosurgeon. And of course, we've talked about free will and philosophy on that one as well. But also one with Diana Rogers on nutrition and with Joel Salatin on farming and, and nutrition. And so today I want to continue talking about that because I think it's important that one of the problems we have is a certain like hyper-reductionist, hyper almost scientistic as opposed to science, a way of of seeing things. And this has really affected the way we think about medicine. Uh, we saw this, of course, well, with COVID. We saw this, of course, with the standard American diet. We've spent really billions of dollars promoting a certain type of diet and the way we care for people and treat disease. And Dr. Ovedia, he has a contrarian view of this. And he says, I have done 3,000 heart surgeries. Don't be my next one. So I'm happy to have Dr. Ovedia on the, on the podcast. Thanks so much for joining. Yeah, great to be here with you, Michael. Um, I've now been on probably you know close to 100 podcasts, if not more. But I think this is the first one focused on philosophy. And I love it because I think, you know, mindset philosophy uh, really has a uh, big role in our health. Uh, so excited to get into this conversation with you. Great. Thanks so much. Well, why, why don't we start by just talking a little bit about your story? So you had a, a shift both in your own life, saying how you eat, how you think, but also in treating your patients. And you came to this realization that maybe what you had learned in medical school and the way you were treating patients and the way you were living were actually a source of heart attacks, at least or the way you were living, at least not the way you were treating patients. But, but um, can you talk about that story, how you got to where you are and the shift in both your own lifestyle and your, your medical practice? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, my, both my personal and my professional life, I think, have led me to the point that I am today. So, you know, on the professional side of things, I have been a heart surgeon now for 20 years, as you said, done over 3000 heart surgeries. But for much of that time, I was a very unhealthy heart surgeon. You know, I had struggled with obesity my whole life uh, since childhood. And I had gotten to a point where I was morbidly obese, pre-diabetic. And I realized I was going to end up on my own operating table, so to speak. I was going down the same pathway that so many of my patients had gone down. I have family history of heart disease. So I was, you know, classic a uh, future patient of my own, uh, I would say. And I was at a loss about what to do about that because, you know, I had tried many times to lose weight. I had followed the advice that I had been educated to give, you know, eat less, move more, eat a low fat diet, you know, pay attention to the, the food pyramid, the U.S. dietary guidelines. We're all familiar with the advice that's out there. And yet it wasn't working for me. And honestly, it wasn't working for my patients because so many of them had followed the advice as well. And yet they were still ending up on my operating table. Thankfully, I started to come across some different information. I started to ask some different questions, which I think is important. And, you know, ultimately I realized that the primary determinant of our health our health in general and our heart health is the food that we are eating. And, you know, the types of food that we eat really are more important than the amount of food that we eat, which goes against the traditional thinking, the sort of calories in, calories out model. I uh, was exposed to the concept of, you know, 
low carbohydrate diets and eliminating sugar. Um, I really first learned of it from uh, Gary Tobbs, who you know has written some many yep. of the definitive books on the subject. And mm -hmm. you know, most importantly, I, I I ran the experiment on myself first. I guess is what you would say. I went low carb. I eliminated sugar. I was able to lose over a hundred pounds, get into you know the best shape of my life, and more importantly, I've been able to maintain that now for going on seven years, which is different than before. And along the way, you know, I realized that this information is what can help my patients as well and um, help my future patients not to need me. And really, you know, I, I came to recognize along the way that the vast majority of the surgeries that I do are preventable and should be preventable. And it's really that we are giving people, giving patients bad information. They are following bad advice that is leading them to my operating table. Uh, so that's caused me to, you know, refocus my career some, add a different dimension to my career. I continue to do heart surgery, but I really am on a mission to keep as many people as possible off of my operating table. Yeah, that's good. That's a great story and very interesting. So let, let me ask maybe a couple of questions. I mean, it seems, and by the way, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong on any of these, if my question is not framed properly. Uh, one of the things it seemed historically that there was this sense, I mean, I think it was Dwight Eisenhower had a heart attack. Everybody got super nervous. And Ansel Keys had done a, done a study where it looks as if he cherry picked the data to show a direct correlation between saturated fat, cholesterol, and heart attacks. And this really created this standard American diet food pyramid. You know, I have children and they're in school and they're studying and what do they get? The standard American diet. And so they're like, wait, dad, everything you tell us <laughs> is different than what we're learning in the school. And that's partially because I don't think you should trust the government to, to tell you what to eat. But uh, and that's for, I think, a lot of reasons, knowledge and also crony capitalism and subsidies and bad incentives, a lot of reasons. And feel free to comment on any of those. But it seems like this idea came... Everybody was like, oh, we've got to get off of butter and eggs and meat and red meat and bacon. And we've got to have, you know, low fat milk and low fat blueberry muffins. And what happened is it made everybody fat. We don't need to talk about COVID, but it actually made people susceptible to dying of COVID more easily, I think, from yeah, what I understand. Certainly. So you want to, why don't you, you want to give a little bit of that history and, and, and what happened? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you're exactly right. You know, starting in the 1950s, uh, there was concern because the incidence of heart disease was going up. Uh, realize that, you know, we have reports from uh, prominent physicians who were practicing, you know, in the early 1900s that basically went their whole career without ever seeing heart disease. Heart attacks were exceedingly rare in the early 1900s. Uh, and then we start to see, you know, 1930s, 1940s, especially in the 1950s, the incidence of heart disease rising in the United States. And then, as you said, a sitting president in office has a heart attack. And this, of course, sets off the alarm bells. Ansel Keys, who was a pretty unknown scientist uh, at the time, not a medical doctor, but, uh, you know, he put forth this theory that uh, saturated fat, uh, the amount of saturated fat that people were eating in their diets is what was causing heart disease. And as you said, he published a uh, seminal study. The original study was actually called the Six Countries Study. And in that paper, he graphs out the uh, amount of saturated fat that's consumed at the population level in six countries and their incidence of heart disease. And it looks like a perfect line. The problem is he had data from 22 countries and he picked the six countries that, you know, lined up nicely. For instance, he did not use the data from France that at the time had the highest consumption of saturated fat and the lowest incidence of heart disease. Uh, but that then set us down a pathway uh, where, you know, this theory was then promoted. Ansel Keys was able to get himself 
to prominence. You know, he was an advisor to the president's physicians. He got uh, involved with the American Heart Association. And, you know, the train started down the tracks. And then, like you said, you know, this uh, reached the level in the 1970s that they were having congressional hearings and uh, made the decision that, you know, the government needs to tell people what to eat. And um, I, like you, share uh, the reasons to be skeptical of that. Uh, but what's interesting from that, you know, committee is that the scientists that were advising that committee basically told them that we don't have enough evidence to really be telling people what to eat. You know, the evidence as to saturated fat being harmful in the diet, they did not feel that the scientific evidence uh, supported that. And the committee members, the congressmen, basically said, well, we don't have time to wait for the science. You know, we need to act because this was felt to be an emergency. So 1980, the first, uh, you know, version of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines is released. Between, you know, over the last 40 years, while that advice has been basically the same, you know, some tweaks, but basically the same, the macro level consumption here in the U.S. has fallen in line with the U.S. Dietary Guidelines. We eat less fat, we eat less meat, we eat more grains, cereals, processed food, and our health has worsened by any metric you can look at. We've basically had no impact on the incidence of heart disease, what we were supposedly targeting. Obesity, diabetes, all of these things have you know, risen exponentially during that time. Uh, so anyone looking at that with a scientific mind will say, this experiment is failing, you know? And so there are two possible explanations, you know, either people aren't following the advice or the advice is wrong. And like I said, we know that largely people are following the advice. We see the, the change in consumption. So you have to step back logically and say the advice must be wrong. But, you know, like many institutional, you know, once the ideas take hold in the institution, it's hard to change that direction. And it's very, you know, difficult for these large institutions like the U.S. government to come out and say, oh, yeah, we were wrong for the past 40 years this is what you should have been doing. So that's the situation we find ourselves in today. Yeah, that's interesting. So not too long ago, a colleague told me about this thing called Campbell's Law. Have you heard of this? Uh, don't know if I'm familiar with yeah, that one. I had, I had never heard of it. Okay, but it's interesting. He, he said he was a, Donald Campbell was a so, psychologist and social scientist. And he said, the law is, the more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision-making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures and the more apt to distort and corrupt the social processes it is intended to monitor. That's, I think, a great example of what happened with food, right? Because it ended up creating a vicious circle. And then you, you combine it with uh, the public, what you know, in economics is called the public choice problem, right? Where individuals and in have incentive, institutions have incentives like individuals. Uh, it's simply put, but it's, it, but, and then you have all this incentives and you start to think about, okay, grain is subsidized, soy is subsidized, corn is subsidized, right? Sugar is subsidized. Uh, we protect our sugar producers with tariffs, right? I did a, a documentary film a couple of years ago called Poverty Inc. And uh, it's a critique of global humanitarianism. And one of the things you see in Poverty Inc. is people have good intentions, but the incentives are to give foreign aid because there's incentives to with corporations and governments right, who are benefiting from it, even if it doesn't actually help the poor. And so it, it's yep. really hard for people to say, wait, our system, the idea we had of foreign aid just hasn't worked. Right. And, and it's a very, I think it's, a, it's a, a similar thing to the way how we dealt with food because it becomes so deeply entrenched. One thing that I find interesting, and I have some like specific questions, but on the kind of general picture, why do you think so many physicians are so late to the game? So I, I'll, I'll say one thing. I, years ago, I read uh, Weston Price. Have you read Weston Price? Yes. You have. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he's everywhere. It's kind of interesting. Like if you read Gary Taubes or surprised by, uh, what's it called? Surprised by fat or big fat surprise, right. Or yeah, whatever. I've only read a little right. bit. Of, yeah. I've only read a little bit of that. And then you read all these different like, health books. There's Weston Price. And, and he, oh, yeah. yeah. And he, you know, he, as you know, he was a dentist who went out and he looked and he said, 
he found a number of communities where there was almost no heart disease, no cancer, and he noticed there was a connection to like the mouth, the teeth, and all, but all of them connected to this not eating processed foods. So I wonder, like you go to the hospital, I think maybe even you talked about this in your book, like you go to the hospital and you get hospital food and it's sugar, mm -hmm. low fat, high carbs, and you think, no wonder why people aren't getting any better. And yeah, we talked about the Campbell effect, and obviously this is speculation, but why do you think the medical community has been so slow to recognize, which it's almost seemingly obvious when you step back and think about it. What do you think? Or maybe yeah. maybe it's not obvious. What do you think? Well, you know, so I think it gets lost uh, is really the message. So realize that doctors are educated to treat disease. We're not really educated to prevent it. So, you know, that's one part of the problem. We yeah, don't think in that lens, you know. We think about once the disease is there, once you have heart disease, you know, how do we treat it? And we think about medications and we think about procedures and we don't really step back and say, why did the disease occur in the first place and what could we be doing better to prevent it? And, you know, that that then extends to the healthcare system in general. You know, the healthcare yeah. system, again, is focused on taking care of sick people. It's not necessarily focused on how to prevent people from getting sick in the first place. The educational system for doctors is very much an indoctrination system. And I, I see this now, but I, I certainly didn't see it at the time. You know, we are taught that, you know, there are certain uh, dogmas that can't be questioned, and you have to go with the, they call it evidence-based medicine, uh, but what that really is, is the institutional group think. And so, you know, you look at something like cholesterol being the primary cause of heart disease, mm -hmm. and right. the, the best way for us to prevent heart disease is by managing people's cholesterol levels. And again, you know, that's an unquestionable truth in uh, the medical world. But then you step back and you say, but wait, you know, this isn't working. We have been doing this, you know, now for 30 plus years and, you know, telling people to change their diets to lower their cholesterol and putting them on medication to lower their cholesterol. And yet they're still all ending up with heart disease. You know, heart disease remains far and away the number one killer here in the U.S., you know, and you start to question why this might be. And that's absolutely not allowed within the medical system, within the group think uh, that has really taken over medicine. And, you know, the bigger issue that I see is that physicians are actively discouraged these days from independent thought, from asking mm. questions. And that is a very dangerous trend. And it's not how we made all the great advances in, in medicine uh, that we made. You know, I go back, you know, so I look at some, you know, obviously I have a focus on the heart and I look at the history of heart surgery and I look at just some of the amazing developments that were absolutely crazy. Some of the things that got done, you know, these things would never be allowed to happen today, uh, but that's how we make progress. And you know, you can go through the history of medicine and you can find many, many examples of, you know, things that were accepted as dogma that were later proven not to be true. Uh, you know, things like the germ theory of disease, you know, very right, basic right. things. Uh, Semmelweis you know, washing hands. Yeah, yeah. Semmel, exactly. Semmelweis and washing your hands, uh, you know, and, and people literally called Semmelweis crazy. He, he ended up in a mental institution. He ended up dying in a mental institution yeah. because he was so persecuted by his colleagues. And yet, you know, today it's obvious that, yeah, you should have been washing your hands. So we have this environment that makes it very difficult for physicians to ask these questions. And, you know, I, I think that is really at the root of it. So, you know, when you walk around the hospital, like I do on a daily basis, and I see my patients after surgery with insulin running through an IV in one arm, and with the other arm, they are eating their plate of low fat, you know, high carb breakfast, their pancakes with low fat syrup on it. And you just like, you know, and I just like, this is insanity. And yet it's accepted as, you know, that's the norm. You know, we got to follow the guidelines. The U.S. dietary guidelines say, you know, you got to be eating a low fat diet. And so this is where we end up today. Yeah. So I guess two questions that one, if you have any insight on why you think doctors are 
discouraged from asking questions. And then the second question would be, it seems like there's a almost like a radical separation between nutrition and then the way we think about medicine and healing as if they're, they're unrelated. And again, correct me if you think that's wrong, but how, how would you respond to those questions? No. Yeah. So I, I definitely agree with the second part that we have disconnected nutrition from healthcare, you know, from, like I said, taking care of sick people. Uh, and it's thought that nutrition really plays very little role in that, which is obviously mistaken. Doctors, I think, are largely, you know, trapped within the system today. The vast majority of physicians are no longer independent. They're employed by either a hospital system, an insurance company, you know, large institutions. And anyone who has, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, worked or, you know, existed within a large institutional framework knows that they are typically discouraging of independent thought, you know, they're, they're usually focused on groupthink. And I think the same is true in medicine, you know, and, and we can point to many different components of that. But, you know, you just look at, again, the, the, the medical education system, and it's largely focused on memorizing facts and regurgitating facts. And it's not really focused on teaching physicians how to think independently anymore. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, there, I mean, we could talk about that a, a lot more, but I do want to get into your, your book. Uh, so that's kind of a big picture, but let's talk about maybe some, one of the core arguments of your book. Now I'll use this cover, your book of your cover as the um, cover page for the web, for the website at Moral Imagination, yep. but it's actually a shocking cover. Okay. <laughs> so um, we're only doing a, a audio podcast, but uh, listeners, you can go take a look at it because there's a picture of Dr. Ovidia. He's standing there, arms folded, looking pretty fit, stay off my operating table. And on the bottom is like all this meat, chicken, sausage, but of course, garlic and vegetables and olive oil. And a lot of people would say, wait, you're telling me that, is that the stuff that kills you? Or is that the stuff you're supposed to eat? And so at the core of your argument is the main source of heart disease is poor metabolic health. Can you explain your argument? What is metabolic health? And why do you have such a, a crazy picture of meat on the front of your cover? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so, you know, metabolic health, uh, the way I explain it most simply is when we are metabolically healthy, our body is properly utilizing the inputs that we are giving it. And the primary input that we give our bodies is the food that we eat. When we get metabolically unhealthy, which the vast majority of us are today, the statistics show that 88% of the adults in the United States are not in optimal metabolic health. Our bodies, you know, can't utilize those inputs any longer. And basically, you know, we end up storing too much energy, not being able to utilize that stored energy. So we get in a situation where, you know, we have an abundance of stored energy known as fat, and yet we're hungry all the time and we can't tap into that stored energy. And that has a whole host of uh, downstream effects. I guess you could say, you know, the hypothesis that I put forward in the book and has been put forward by many others is that, you know, this metabolic disease is at the root cause of heart disease. It is not, you know, a high cholesterol level that causes heart disease. Cholesterol plays a role in the process, um, but it's not the root cause. And if you're not able to identify and address the root cause of a disease, you really have no chance of making a you know, meaningful impact against it. Uh, so the natural question that first comes out of that is, from people is, well, how do I know if I'm metabolically healthy or not? Uh, and I think this is an important thing to touch yeah. on. And, you know, I certainly go into it in the book in detail, but there are five basic measures that people should be looking at to determine if they're metabolically healthy. One of them you can check at home, actually a couple of them you can check at home, but starting with your waist circumference, uh, very simple. All you need is a tape measure and, uh, you measure just above the level of your belly button, best to measure it first thing in the morning. And if you're a man, the goal is for that to be less than 40 inches. And if you're a woman, the goal is for it to be less than 35 inches. The next thing that you should be looking at is your blood pressure. 
again, you can measure it at home. You can, you know, any grocery store, pharmacy these days, they all have the little uh, kiosk to measure it. And almost every time you go and see a doctor, you're going to get your blood pressure measured. And your blood pressure should be less than 130 over 85. And that should be without the use of medications. If you have been started on medication for high blood pressure, that is an indicator that you are not metabolically healthy. And then we look at some very basic blood work. Um, again, this is blood work that almost every physician checks, but they don't interpret it necessarily in this context. So they miss some of the signals that are in there. Uh, you want to look at your fasting blood glucose level. So in other words, the amount of sugar that's in your blood when you haven't eaten for approximately 8 to 12 hours. And you want that to be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter is the units here in the United States. And again, without the use of medications. Type 2 diabetes is one of the hallmarks of poor metabolic health. And finally, you know, we look at the cholesterol panel, but we don't look at the one number that so many doctors focus on on that cholesterol panel, the LDL cholesterol, nicknamed bad cholesterol, which is a inaccurate term that I'm not a fan of. Uh, but we actually want to look at two other numbers from that cholesterol panel. We want to look at your HDL cholesterol. And again, this is nicknamed good cholesterol. The reason is because we want it higher confusing to many people, but you want your HDL cholesterol to be high. Uh, specifically, if you're a man, you want it to be over 40 milligrams per deciliter. And if you're a woman, you want it to be over 50 milligrams per deciliter. And finally, we look at your triglycerides. This we do want to be lower. And specifically, you want it to be less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. So, you know, if you just look at those five numbers, those will give you an indication as to whether you're metabolically healthy or not. And as I alluded to before, only 12% of the adults in the United States uh, are able to meet all five measures of optimal metabolic health. So that gives us an indication of how big a problem we are dealing with here. Wow. Yeah, that's a 88%. What's that compared to, like, say, with Europe or other, other places where we have good stats? Do you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, any of the westernized countries, uh, the, the stats are, are bad, but not quite as bad as that. Um, you know, we uh, see the incidence of diabetes, heart disease, metabolic diseases uh, in general rising in all of these westernized countries. And it's really worldwide. You know, it's hard to find populations yeah. these days that are not exposed to the uh, Western you know, diet and the processed food. But when you find those populations, what you consistently see is that they do not suffer from these metabolic diseases. They don't get heart disease. They don't get diabetes. You know, obesity is very rare in those populations. Cancer is very infrequent in those populations. You know, certainly if you go back historically, you can basically follow the path of processed food, Western diets being introduced, and the incidence of disease. And, and, and that's exactly what Western A. Price did, you know, as you said, back in the 1920s, when there were still populations that weren't exposed to these things. And he went and he studied those, and he compared them to the Westernized uh, populations. And it's very obvious um, what's happening. Yeah. So let's maybe we'll go through. There's a, there's a lot there. So maybe you can start to break it down. And since this isn't a medical podcast, it's a philosophy podcast. I'll probably have some physicians listening. We, we got it. Some science, other people are going to maybe want a little bit of explanation. So maybe let's go through a couple of things you, you pointed out. Um, before I ask you about cholesterol, I just want to ask one thing you've mentioned. Another measure that we should be looking at is your triglycerides over your HDL. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Can you explain so that, that really quick? Yeah, so that's kind of a, a, a shortcut, you know, it, like if, if people want, you know, one sort of quick and dirty test to tell if they're likely metabolically healthy or not, I usually point them to the triglycerides divided by the HDL. So uh, you want that ratio. Important to note that this, the ratio needs to be done in U.S. units. If you're converting to the, you know, European units, the ratio changes. But in U.S. units, you want the ratio, your triglycerides divided by your HDL should be less than two. 
ideal is less than one for that ratio. And the reason that that's so important is because it indicates uh, what we call insulin resistance. And, you know, insulin resistance is one of our medical terms, but basically correlates to metabolic health. You know, when you're looking at sort of the physiologic explanation, what happens when we become metabolically unhealthy, it's really centered on insulin resistance. And what that means is that our bodies, the cells of our body are no longer properly responding to insulin, which is one of the main signaling hormones in our body. And that ends up having an effect on the types of uh, cholesterol, the types of lipids that end up in our bloodstream, cholesterol particles and lipid particles that end up in our bloodstream. And so that gets reflected in that ratio. So because, you know, the cholesterol test has become so ubiquitous and, you know, everyone gets their cholesterol checked, the useful information that you can get off of that is looking at the triglyceride to HDL ratio. And that's why I oftentimes point people in that direction if they, you know, if they're trying to figure out if they're metabolically healthy or not. Okay. And then one other just measurement question. And obviously I'll say this probably more than once. This is not a medical advice. We're having a conversation about a book. Always talk to your doctor. I know Dr. Betty would uh, affirm that. There's another uh, cardiologist who says we should also look at total cholesterol over HDL ratio. What do you think about that? Yeah, so I, I don't think that is as useful because the problem we get into when we're looking at, you know, and this gets into the controversy of how much of a role does cholesterol really play yeah. in heart disease and how useful is it to lower your cholesterol level as a preventative measure for heart disease. And the problem, you know, that we really get into at a fundamental level is looking at the amount of cholesterol that you have is really not all that informative. We really want to know the types of cholesterol particles that you have in your blood, uh, whether or not they are damaged cholesterol particles, because in a healthy environment, uh, so in someone who is metabolically healthy, there's really no evidence that having a high overall cholesterol level is harmful. Now, again, like I said, almost everyone is not metabolically healthy, so you have to be very careful uh, in interpreting what I just said. It does not mean that you should be ignoring your cholesterol level, but what it does mean is you should be paying attention to your metabolic health first and foremost, and if you get yourself to a spot where you are metabolically healthy, it is not clear that cholesterol, you know, total cholesterol level is, is meaningful in that context. And some high-level evidence uh, to support that uh, assertion is that about half of the patients that end up on my operating table or, you know, end up in the hospital with heart attacks, we have data in both scenarios, have what are considered normal cholesterol levels, specifically talking about total cholesterol or LDL cholesterol now. So about half of the patients, you know, have levels that are considered normal or considered, you know, acceptable. When you look at the data around metabolic health, insulin resistance, what you see is that about 95% of the patients who come in with heart attacks or end up having heart surgery are insulin resistant. Uh, so again, at a high level, insulin resistance is a much more powerful predictor of heart disease risk than cholesterol. The problem is, is that we don't have a pill to fix insulin resistance. We don't have a quick fix to it. The way to fix insulin resistance, and again, this is getting into the concepts in the book, is to be paying attention to the foods that you're eating, paying attention to the amount of activity that you're getting, and looking at things like, you know, your sleep and your stress. That's how we fix insulin resistance and metabolic health, but that's not as easy as writing the prescription uh, to lower your cholesterol level. Yeah, although I would say it's, it's a lot more exciting because it talks about human agency. Because I think, yep. and again, feel free to push back on anything I say. When I was reading about heart disease and various books and and then a lot on diet, like one, you sometimes you you feel almost overwhelmed. Like the statement you said, like, well, you know, half the patients having heart attacks have normal cholesterol. And you think, 
oh, so like, what am I going to do? Right. Or half the patients this, but when we start thinking about metabolic health and that 95% of the patients have insul insulin resistance and you think, well, there's no medicine for that, but here's what you can do. You can eat let fewer sugars, fewer carbs, meat, fish, vegetables. You can lift weights, uh, sleep more and, um, you know, work on your stress. You think, okay, I can do that. I mean, that's like something I can do. And in a sense, I know like for myself, there's agency there. You're not just relying upon, and, and I say this, I'll nuance it in a second, but you're not just relying upon magic. Like here, take this pill, yep. see what happens. Because you don't know what all the off target effects or the other negative things are going to be. You don't exactly know if it's going to work. Like statins, people are like, oh, take statins. Well, there's negative effects to statins, right? There's trade-offs. You start messing with your body, you know, it's difficult. But the agency of, I get to eat, more steak. <laughs> I like that part. I get to eat more yeah. steak and vegetables and I have to learn to deadlift and I have to make sure I'm sleeping seven or eight hours a night. Those things I can do. And, and yeah. that's kind of, I don't know. So, so to me, it seems a really empowering, like it's agency. Now look, sometimes, you know, people get sick, people die. There's no technical solution to the problem of death, right? Uh, Yuval Harari writes, you know, he thinks death is a glitch we can solve. I don't think so. Right. Yeah. But you can't do something. And so anyway, that's I, that we'll go back and I want to go into cholesterol and insulin resistance in a minute. But just I think as far as like you talked about philosophy and mindset and, and all these things, that to me is a very positive thing. I mean, how, how do you react to that? Yeah, no, I think that's uh, very much true. You know, one of the central messages, I think, of my book, uh, you know, is that you are in control of your health. You can take back control of your health. You know, we should not be outsourcing our health to the government, to the pharmaceutical industry, or quite frankly, even to your doctor, because, you know, it's up to you, the individual, to take charge of your health, to make yourself healthy, to keep yourself healthy. And we do all have the power to do this. You know, one of the other unfortunate things that I have seen in medicine is we kind of have taken away hope from people. We have normalized getting sick. We have made it almost expected. You know, you hear it all the time. Oh, well, you're just getting older. You know, this comes with getting older. And, you know, there isn't evidence that this is how it should be. Again, when you look at those populations, you know, those ancestral populations or, you know, the populations that have avoided processed food, they live a long and healthy life. And then they, you know, usually then, then they just die, you know, uh, truly of old age, uh, but they don't suffer the last, you know, third or, or quarter of their life uh, with chronic disease. And, you know, so that's the hope that I'm trying to give back to people that you can stay off my operating table, you know, uh, that you can do this and you can remain healthy and vibrant. And yes, you're right. We haven't solved the death problem. We're all going to get there eventually. Uh, but you can be doing these really simple things. Doesn't mean that they're easy to do, but they are very simple concepts. Like you said, just eat real food. I mean, that that's what I tell people. Um, you know, and get some activity and get some sleep. And, you know, you're going to have a major impact on your health outcomes. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's true. I think maybe this, this is something I just thought of as you're talking. I think there's another confusion maybe people have uh, because we talk about life expectancy. And so life expectancy is like 79 years or 78 years and et cetera. And in fact, we've just seen a decrease in the United States for the first time among like yep. white working class people, which is, um, I think related to metabolic health and other things, drugs, et cetera. Um, Angus Deaton wrote a book called deaths of despair about this, but, but I think there's a little confusion about life expectancy. Cause you know, you hear like, well, life expectancy was 27 or life expectancy was 35. And what I think people don't realize is that's not the average age. Everybody died. Life right. expectancy had to do with infant mortality. So you have people, you know, the Bible Psalm uh, 90 says 70 years, 80 to those who are strong. Right. So that's the lifespan, 70 years, 80 to those who are strong. And uh, you have this, like you have a long lifespan for thousands of years. It's not like a, a new thing. Why, the reason why life expectancy increased dramatically was because germ theory, you, know, you talked about Semmelweis germ theory, uh, lowering yep. of infant mortality, a lot of wonderful increases in, in, in medicine and, and scientific health. But I think, I think maybe that's another thing that people don't think about. They think, well, you know, you just, 
either like, well, at least we get to live a long time. And I think what you're saying is, well, you can live a long time. And of course, you, some people are going to get sick. It, you, you can't solve every problem. But if you have better metabolic health, if you do these things, you can actually live longer and healthier than you would otherwise. Right. Is that, you think that's fair? Yes, definitely. You know, one important thing to realize, recognize about metabolic health, you know, my focus is on heart disease, but it's not just heart disease. You go right. down the list of the top 10 causes of death every year in the United States. Um, and, you know, seven or eight of them are clearly related to metabolic health. You know, many forms of cancer are clearly related to metabolic health. Diabetes, as I said, hallmark of metabolic health. Alzheimer's right. disease, uh, yep. you know, something that we've really, you know, again, we're kind of mirroring the experience, you know, what happened around heart disease in the 1950s is happening around Alzheimer's disease today because oh, the incidence is going up so high. And Alzheimer's disease, all the evidence points to it being a metabolic disease. Many, mm. uh, you know, scientists refer to it as diabetes of the brain. Uh, so, that's what's most powerful about metabolic health is that it's not just going to address, you know, the top cause of death, heart disease, but it's going to address all of the top causes of death. And oh, by the way, you know, for the past two years, uh, that includes uh, the COVID pandemic. And we know, again, that being metabolically unhealthy predisposes right. you to getting COVID and having worse outcomes once you get COVID. And the messaging that I would have liked to see, and so many of my colleagues would have liked to see over the last couple of years, was get yourself metabolically healthy uh, so that we can get ourselves out of this pandemic. This is why I said before is that, I mean, I, this is a little bit brutal, but I mean, if you look at like the United States government's recommendations for eating made people fat, obese, yep. gave them diabetes. And it's so, in some ways, frustrating. Like, there's all these people are fat and everybody goes, Oh, Americans are fat. Americans have diabetes. Yeah. Cause they obeyed the government and then the crony capitalists and the subsidies and all this stuff. And so I'm not saying they're not at fault. Everybody has human agency. I'm not denying free will or anything, but I'm saying like, you think you're doing your best. You're like, okay, I'll give me skim milk and uh, some granola and a blue fat, you know, non-fat blueberry muffin. No, I won't have the eggs and bacon with butter that I really want. Right. I mean, people made sacrifices to not eat eggs and bacon, to eat margarine, and it ended up actually making them susceptible to death from COVID. I mean, do you think that's too yeah. strong or it's accurate? No, no, I think that's exactly right, you know, and uh, that's why I think we really need to be pushing back against this, because how do we overcome that? The answer is, you know, we as individuals need to basically start ignoring the advice. And the problem becomes, you know, we are now in an environment where that becomes very difficult. Uh, we are literally surrounded by this processed food uh, that was created in response to these guidelines. You know, it's promoted, it's advertised. Uh, starting from birth, we are exposed to it. You know, you look at infant formulas and they are, you know, high carbohydrate processed foods. There is a physical addiction component to this. You know, sugar is addictive. Yep. Again, we have plenty, plenty of science. Uh, everyone, you know, most people have probably heard uh, the, the study reference that, you know, suggests that sugar is more addictive than heroin. So this has literally been baked into society. And so, you know, it becomes very difficult to buck those norms. And, you know, when you're out there, you know, like myself, just saying, well, just eat whole real food. You know, basically, if you're walking into a supermarket, you want to ignore 90 percent of the supermarket because that is not food, you know, and you just want to kind of stick to those, that outside, you know, the produce and the meat and the dairy and you're going to be fine. Uh, but it, it, it's increasingly right. difficult to live like that. Yeah, I think a couple of things. So listeners, some of you may remember, but I, I had a podcast with uh, my good friend, Jay Richards. I've had a couple, but one on his book, Eat Fast and Feast, which I'll talk about, and another one with Diana Rogers um, on nutrition. So Jay Richards in this book, Eat Fast and Feast, uh, he's talking about thinking about how to fast, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, Jews, Christians, Muslims fast, right? And yep. he said, it's really hard for 
people to fast. And so I'm Catholic and Catholics have to fast. We have to fast in Lent and, and other times too, uh, but, but especially Lent. And so he said, and I'll do this short, but listeners, if you heard it, apologize. And if not, go listen to this episode because I think it'll overlap with a lot of, of what, what we're talking about in this conversation. And he points out, you know, like imagine if say, okay, the three eminently good works in Lent are fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. So imagine if you're like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm just going to pray for an extra 10 minutes and you got excruciating headaches and you said, I'm going to be a little bit more generous with my money. And all of a sudden, like your arm was filled with pain as you tried to give the money away. He said, that's what happens to us when we, when we fast, because we're so used to this like two hour cycle because, and I want you to explain this, uh, in, in better terms than I will, but we're so used yeah. to this two hour circle of like getting like our sugars. And, and so what happens is we think we're hypoglycemic when in fact we're not hypoglycemic. We've just habituated ourselves to having immediate need and crash, immediate need and crash because we're not in metabolic health. And so it's, and this is, I think what, what he does in his book is he says, look, here's a way to start, like start by doing your intermittent fast for eight hours, then get it to 10, then get it to 12, right? Start by going on a keto diet. And what happens is you, over time, you start to be, you stop storing all this energy. You start to be able to use energy and be able to live without immediate sugar highs. Um, but as you, yeah, as you say, it's hard in the beginning. And so it seems overwhelming. And one of the reasons I liked Jay's book, um, is not only is it like practical and, and like a, kind of a broad thinking in terms of, of mental, spiritual, and physical health, but also because it's a model, like here's how I do it. It's very hard to go from the standard American diet to carnivore. You're just going to fail almost certainly. Right. But if you go on a ketogenic diet and you drink some butter coffee, and <laughs> you kind of make it easy on yourself. I think you can transform. So, I mean, go ahead and comment on that if you have any ad additional things, but I just thought it was really important that your point that it's not easy, but it is very possible. Yeah. So, you know, uh, fasting, I agree, you know, very powerful tool for improving your metabolic health. I take a little bit of a different approach to it. And, you know, what I want people to do is eat in a way that they are hungry less often. So oftentimes, you know, people will look at something like fasting and they'll say, okay, I got to fast for eight hours. I got to fast for 12 hours. I got to fast for 16 hours. And they're kind of, you know, white knuckling their way through it. And, you know, that it's not sustainable. And oftentimes you end up overeating, you know, uh, to, to compensate for the fasting time. And instead, what I try to get people to do is look at the food that you're eating. And when you eat something, again, it should make you less hungry. But all too often, the foods that we eat make us more hungry. And again, this is what processed foods are designed to do. Uh, looking at it from the food company's standpoint, you know, they are like every other corporation and their mission, you know, their calling is to increase their profits, is to make, you know, uh, more money. So if you're a food company, what do you want to do? You want to make people hungry more often so they'll buy more of your food. And we have to, again, step back and look at, you know, you don't even have to go on the evolutionary scale, you know, just go back to your grandparents or great grandparents. And the likelihood is that they were eating, you know, twice a day, maybe three times a day. They were not eating eight to 10 right. times a day, which again is what the statistics show today. You know, the average person consumes calories and this includes drinking calories, which is its whole own problem. But the average person consumes calories eight to 10 times a day. So do the math. You're asleep for six hours or seven hours, you know, and you're eating 10 times, you know, you're eating basically every hour or two. And on a physiologic yeah. level, you're right. You know, it's because our bodies are dependent on sugar for energy. Sugar is a fast burning fuel. And so every hour or two, you have to refill the tank as opposed to if you're burning fat for energy, fat is a slow burning food. It gives you that more consistent, longer energy. And so, you know, you find yourself just not being hungry. And that's one of the most powerful things that I have experienced. And, you know, yeah. my patients now experience is when you're eating whole real food, you're just not hungry all the time. And so yep. fasting becomes a natural thing. You know, I, I oftentimes will end up, you know, and it will be 16, it'll be 24 hours and I haven't eaten. Uh, and I'm just like, oh, 
I haven't eaten anything. I guess I should eat something, you know, or I start to get a little hungry and that's when I eat. We have lost that connection again with our bodies, with our minds to recognize, you know, when you're actually hungry and therefore you should be eating as opposed to we just eat habitually now. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I want to go into some of the rec- steps you do, but if you have a little bit of time, I think there's two things that I'd like to go through that you've talked about a lot and maybe it would be helpful to explain. So you talk about insulin resistance and then also cholesterol. Tell me what you think we should start with insulin or cholesterol. And then I'll ask my question. Yeah. So I, I think we should start with insulin because it's, okay. it's the more important, uh, you know, factor in all of this. Okay, good. Because I think the cholesterol, I, I think I'm thinking of questions or objections people would have. All right. So can you walk through just a little bit? You've talked about insulin resistance. 95% of patients who have heart attacks or end up on your operating table have insulin resistance. You talked about the importance of blood glucose and, and, and measuring your insulin resistance. Could you walk through what it is, why it matters, and then we can start talking a little bit about the food, but we can go then to how, how the uh, eating, uh, what you could call various. And you talk about, you know, ketogenic or carnivore or paleo, however, there's a lot of different things, but basically whole real foods, l- low carbohydrates, few processed foods or none, low sugars. We'll talk about that, but can you talk about the insulin resistance since so we can explain the science behind it? Yeah. So, you know, insulin is basically, uh, the master hormone in our body when it comes to the trafficking of energy. Let's put it that way. You know, food is essentially our energy source. It's the fuel that we burn. And what insulin does is it's supposed to regulate, you know, how much of that fuel gets used immediately, how much of that fuel gets put into storage, you know, and then when that fuel can then come out of storage. When we eat carbohydrates of any form, processed, non-processed, you know, so any carbohydrate is going to cause your insulin level to go up. When we eat fat, our insulin level does not go up. And when you eat protein, there's a, a, a minimal response. Your insulin goes up a little bit, but, but typically not nearly as much as, you know, with carbohydrates. So when we're constantly eating carbohydrates, um, which again is what the standard American diet, the standard Western diet is, our insulin levels are constantly going up. And uh, like we alluded to before, you know, if you eat very often, you never give your, your body a chance for those insulin levels to come down. And one of the important things that happens is whenever your insulin is elevated, Uh, that is a signal to your body that we need to store energy. We can't release any energy from our fat cells when insulin levels are high. And over time, if your insulin level is constantly running high, the fat cells, your storage cells, get to a point where they're like, we can't store any more energy, and they basically stop responding to the insulin at that point. Um, So that's basically what insulin resistance is. And, you know, it has a whole host of other effects. You know, you can look at things like fatty liver disease that comes from insulin resistance. You can look at the damage to your blood vessel walls that comes from insulin resistance and therefore leads to heart disease. You can look at the effects in the brain, as I said, that contribute to things like Alzheimer's disease and many mental health uh, issues. But, you know, this is what happens when we become insulin resistant. Okay. And then at the end of that, in a sense, if you, if that goes to a certain point, then you become pre-diabetic and then diabetic where you, now you, you can't produce, can you explain that really quickly? Yeah. So, you know, basically when your cells stop responding to the insulin, um, now, you know, one of the other things that insulin does is it causes the sugar in your bloodstream to, you know, again, go into these cells. And if your cells stop responding to insulin, now the sugar just stays in your bloodstream. It has no place to go. Uh, So this is when we get, you know, diabetes. Uh, Diabetes is diagnosed by high blood sugar. The thing that I find tragic today is that, you know, we don't diagnose it as diabetes until we get the high blood sugar. If we were looking at insulin levels, if we were measuring insulin resistance, you can see the signals 
that this is going to occur years in advance, decades in advance. But we don't look at that. You know, getting your insulin level checked is not a routine, you know, part of your blood panel. You'll get your glucose checked, but you won't get your insulin checked if you go for, you know, kind of the routine physical examination and the routine blood work that most physicians prescribe. And again, the glucose going up, your blood sugar going up is a very late finding in this process. So one of the other things that's powerful about evaluating metabolic health is you can see the warning signs much earlier and therefore you can intervene and make the changes so that they don't get to those end stages like diabetes and heart disease and Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So, and so what would you say? I mean, if you go to your doctor, you can ask for insulin levels. Yes, you should ask them work. for an insulin level. You should ask them to assess your metabolic health. Unfortunately, you might get a blank stare back because, again, this is not something that's really emphasized that most doctors are educated to do. You know, one of the things that's sort of been most interesting about my journey to me is that, you know, this isn't stuff I learned in medical school. Uh, this no. is stuff I had to then go out and, you know, kind of learn on my own, learn from some of the other physicians, other scientists, and quite frankly, even, you know, non-physicians, non-scientists who have been figuring this out for themselves, the citizen scientists out there, we'll call them. And, you know, those are the sources of a lot of this information. Not that it's, you know, not supported by the scientific literature. It's just that- right that scientific literature is not emphasized, is not paid attention to. You know, one of the principles I talk about in my book uh, for people who want to be metabolically healthy is you need to find a physician or, you know, a healthcare practitioner of some sort who understands this and can be your partner. Uh, because oftentimes, you know, your family physician is not able to do that. They, they simply have not been educated about it. They don't have the time to, you know, get educated about it. And they just don't understand this at the root cause level that it needs to be addressed at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I think that's a good idea. I know that just personally, like I mentioned this to you. So I have a cardiologist and I see him every once in a while. I said, okay, he told me a book to read. I read the book and then I found your book and I said, okay, I would like these tests. And he said, okay. And then I, what do you want? I said, well, it looks like I should take this test, this test, this test, this one, then this one, this one. He's like, okay, okay. And then he's like, well, what's your resting heart rate? Okay. You don't need that. Okay. What's this? Okay. And then he kind of went through him. He's like, okay. And his assistant was there and she's typing and she says, oh, insurance doesn't cover that. And I said, okay, how much is it? She said, it'll be $70. And I thought, $70. I'll take it. Now, of course, $70 isn't cheap, but it wasn't $7,000 like I was expecting. And a couple of times I've had that happen where it's like $70 to $100 for these tests. And he told me, you know, you're really the only patient I have who asks questions like this and who wants preventive care. Everybody else is just kind of helping. And he said, I'd like to do more of that. But I think it goes back to your point that a lot of the ways that the system is set up is it's just kind of caring for sickness instead of thinking preventive. And, um, you know, I ask, it's funny, like both of us, he and I both have our like phones and he's, he recommends a book and I buy it on Amazon. And I looked, I recommended a book and he bought it on Amazon right there. He just, and, um, and one of them was on weightlifting actually. And, um, he, he read the whole thing and like, you know, and on weight and the effects of heavy lifting on metabolic health. And it was very, it's very interesting. All these things are out there. So I do think, I think that's right. Getting a physician who will work with you. And as you said, there's what, I guess what you call citizen scientists out there who I just, so we don't forget, who do you recommend that you think is worth people reading and getting insight who, who you think explain things really well, have been helpful to you? Uh, in terms of the the kind of citizen scientists or yeah. physicians in general? Bo yeah, bo Both, anybody. Like I know you recommend in your book, Sean O'Mara. And I've read some of his stuff and he does work on like sprinting and, and um, visceral yep. fat and stuff like that. Is there anybody you just think these are people that you think are like clear on this? Because I, because there's going to be people who say, wait a minute, I mean, this Dr. Ovedia, he's, he's out there. Right. But if there's a lot of people working on this in very, in different oh, yeah. ways, um, who, who do you recommend? Yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, we already alluded to him, but if you're going to start, you know, I, I would start the way I started. And that is with Gary Tobbs, you know, mm -hmm. uh, his yep. book, uh, you know, good calories, bad calories or why we get fat. 
and then the case against sugar, you know, really go through this, you know, and, and Gary has a scientific background, uh, yeah. but is a journalist. So, you know, he's able to tell the story well, you know, as opposed to, you know, maybe some of these books that are maybe too scientific uh, sometimes. Another, uh, you know, if you specifically want to look at heart disease, uh, I'm a big fan of Malcolm Kendrick. And uh, he has a book, a uh, more recent book, it's called The Clot Thickens. And uh, he really goes into, you know, uh, what are the root causes of heart disease and, and the science behind it. Excellent book. Very, you know, a, a newer sort of aspect of this, but again, we've alluded to it a few times, is the relationship between mental health and metabolic health. Uh, yeah. And uh, Dr. Christopher Palmer uh, just released a uh, excellent book on that called Brain Energy. Uh, yeah, I haven't really read. I've seen about, it. I haven't. Yeah, I want to read it. I highly recommend it. You know, talking about the effects of metabolic health on our mental health, and, and really recognizing that connection, which again are dots that don't get connected typically. And there are many other excellent, you know, books out there on, on the subject. Uh, Dr. Robert Lustick, uh, Metabolical, uh, mm -hmm. is a good uh, overview of, of metabolic health as well. What's interesting to me, you know, is I now go to, uh, you know, low carb keto, you know, metabolic health conferences and to see the variety of the types of physicians that are there. And then to also see the interactions with, you know, the non-physicians that are there, like I said, the citizen scientists and the interesting work that they're doing, guys like Dave Feldman, who does a lot of work on cholesterol, Ivor Cummins, uh, another excellent resource, you know, on metabolic health and, and uh, heart disease. Uh, and and they're, they're both, you know, they're engineers and computer scientists. And mm -hmm. it's interesting to see the perspective that they bring to this. Uh, because again, one of the other issues that I see in medicine with physicians evaluating data is that we look at something like the fact that half of the patients that end up on my operating table, you know, have normal cholesterol levels. And we just say, oh, well, it must be something else. It must be genetics. It must be this. But, you know, cholesterol is still the end all and be all despite that evidence. And, you know, yeah. computer scientists and engineers don't accept that. They're like, if yeah. there is one exception to the rule, it indicates that the rule is wrong, you know, that the rule is broken. And uh, we need to figure out what actually is going on here. You know, again, looking at root cause problems. And so that's really changed the way that I think about a lot of these things. You know, it's you interesting. Need philosophers, don't forget philosophers. We're yeah, no, exactly. You know, I look back <laughs> at uh, the way that I used to sort of approach medicine, the way that I used to, you know, just function as a doctor. And I'm kind of amazed that I didn't see this, you know, <laughs> but you don't know what you don't know. You don't see yeah. it. But once you see it, you can't unsee it. And it becomes, mm -hmm. you know, so glaringly obvious, the issues that are all around us. And, and so, you know, I do kind of kick myself. And I do feel bad that I spent so many years giving patients bad advice. You know, I didn't know any better, but, you know, that was a lot of lost opportunity. Well, I mean, this is part of life, right? I mean, we it's incremental yeah. learning and we have to be humble. And the good thing is that you, you, I mean, the humility to say, okay, well, I didn't know, but I didn't know I didn't know. And so I think that's an attitude that we all have to cultivate because, you know, not just physicians, all, all of us, right? Scientists, computer scientists, everybody, we get this hubris in the things we think we know. And so we're not open to other ways of learning. And I think it's, it's just something very important that we have to continually cultivate. And that's actually a virtue. It's a virtue of, of intellectual humility uh, instead of uh, thinking we know everything. So, you know, that's the way it is. That's good. Super good recommendations. Let me um, ask you. Just a couple more questions. I know you. we don't want to take too much more of your time, but I do think it would be helpful to address just a couple more things. One of them is cholesterol. So the kind of elephant in the room of this conversation, uh, we talked a little bit about Ansel Keys. We talked about uh, the cherry picking of the data and the connection between saturated and fat cholesterol. But yeah. as you said, everybody's talking about cholesterol, 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 cholesterol. And one of the things that you and others have talked about is that we have to think of cholesterol in a different way, that cholesterol is a symptom 
or a response, and correct me if I represent this incorrectly, a symptom or a response to lacking of metabolic health, right? To metabolic disease, that you're getting cholesterol forming in a sense to protect your heart, your arteries, your cardiovascular system, but then it also becomes a danger. And so the focus on cholesterol was really, and again, please correct me, but the focus on cholesterol was it was a sign, but we were looking at the symptom instead of the cause. So we thought cholesterol was bad instead of realizing that it was other sources. Did I get that generally yeah. right? Yeah. So the way that I explain cholesterol to people is that, you know, cholesterol is the body's repair mechanism. Uh, when the blood vessel wall gets damaged by things like, you know, high blood glucose, insulin resistance, poor metabolic health, uh, the inflammation that comes with it, the body sends cholesterol to repair that damage. It's basically like the spackle that we, you use, you know, when you punch a hole in the wall. And the problem is if you keep, you know, punching holes in your wall and you keep, you know, putting more and more spackle on at some point, you know, you have a, a basically a big pile of spackle that's sticking out of your wall. Now, again, when you look at it in that context, you would say, well, the obvious answer is stop punching holes in your wall. But we in medicine instead have said, well, let's just get rid of the spackle, you know, and, and that must be the solution to the problem. And it ignores the fact that, again, you know, the nicknames that we have given these things, good mm -hmm. cholesterol and bad cholesterol, they serve a purpose of, you know, okay, well, obviously if it's bad cholesterol, we need to get rid of it. Uh, but again, our bodies do not, you know, make things to kill ourselves. So, you know, cholesterol is ubiquitous. We have it, you know, it's present in our bodies, you know, from birth until death. We literally could not live without it. And it serves very many vital purposes. It only becomes problematic, you know, when the environment becomes problematic. Uh, so, you know, again, you damage the blood vessel wall and now cholesterol can get into the blood vessel wall where it's not supposed to be. Once it's in the blood vessel wall, it sets off an immune response, an inflammatory response. The cholesterol itself gets damaged by, you know, being in this environment of insulin resistance, uh, what we call oxidized. And, you know, these again are the root causes. So you can take the approach that, you know, okay, well, if we just get rid of as much cholesterol as possible, you know, that's going to take care of the problem. Uh, but the reality is, is that doesn't take care of the problem. It has a small impact on the problem ultimately. And when you look at the true statistics around, uh, you know, cholesterol lowering medications, you see that their impacts are actually pretty small. Uh, there's a lot of advertising that makes it seem like they're larger, and we can get into all sorts of the statistical uh, trickery that goes into that. But in the end, like I said, you know, cholesterol is clearly not the root cause of heart disease. And if you're not addressing the root cause of a disease, you're not going to be able to make uh, the meaningful impact that we want. And um I can point to the high level evidence of that. Again, cholesterol lowering medications have been the number one class of medications prescribed for the past 30 years. And there has been no meaningful impact on the incidence of heart disease uh, over the past 30 years. And people will say, okay, well, what's the harm in lowering your cholesterol? Well, the harm in lowering your cholesterol is, you know, the dietary approach uh, that was taken because we wanted to lower people's cholesterol levels. Again, low fat diet, highly processed diet, more carbohydrates, more sugar, and it has made the problem worse instead of making it better. And so that really becomes the harm. You know, the pharmaceuticals we can, we can go back and forth on, and it, it, it's a very complex discussion, but the food approach that we took because of this notion that we needed to lower cholesterol levels is really, I think, the bigger issue. Okay. Yeah. So let me summarize this. So what you're saying is we can talk about there may or may not be negative impacts of statins, right? Which is a cholesterol medication. Right. Um, uh, so we can talk about that. And that's an important thing to talk about. We can talk about the pharmacological approach to medicine. But one of your main concerns is that 
in, especially through media and the government, in the mind of Americans, you have to lower cholesterol and you do that by not eating meat, not eating red meat, not eating eggs, not eating cheese, not eating butter, not eating cream. But actually, what you're arguing is that's what we should be eating. We should stop eating the non-fat blueberry muffins and the low-fat milk. We should be eating those you know, meat and cream and cheese because those things give us more energy. They're important for metabolic health and they're important for our mental health. Did I summarize you correctly? Yeah, exactly. And again, okay. you know, these are the foods that we evolved as human beings eating. So again, you know, if you want to look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, it wouldn't make sense uh, that, you know, our bodies would negatively react to foods that have been in our environment literally for millions of years. That just is not the way that evolution works. So that is, you know, uh, another central, I think, uh, piece of evidence and it's only, you know, in modern times that we, you know, we basically created a problem that we thought we had to fix. Uh, you know, one of my favorite sayings is that, you know, human beings are the only species smart enough to invent their own food and dumb enough to eat it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I mean, I think this connects really to the moral, I mean, the, what the moral imagination is. So, I mean, Edmund Burke said, we've emptied out the wardrobe of the immoral imagination and we have this almost like very reductionist, hyper-rationalistic view. But the interesting thing that relates to things you were saying, it looks like science. It appears like science, but it ends up not being science. It ends up becoming easily co-opted by groupthink or by ideology yeah. or by, you know, capture, regulatory capture, whatever. And I think, and this is why I think it's so important. So, okay. So last kind of medical question before we get into the, your final kind of recommendations. And I do recommend this book. It's a, it's actually a short book. It's an easy read. Stay off my operating table. I, I highly recommend it. I'm going to put links to this book and all the books that you recommended on moralimagination.com on, on your, on the episode page. But one thing you mentioned is inflammation. And this seems to be a, a, another thing that's connected, right? To metabolic health, and to heart disease, that certain things create inflammation, but that's also connected to cancer and other diseases, right? Like uh, autoimmune diseases right. as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Could you just give at least a, a primer on that? Yeah. So, you know, what I would uh, say is that, you know, inflammation is intimately related with metabolic health and it's kind of a two way street. So, when we become metabolically unhealthy, and like I said, we start damaging the blood vessel wall and then, you know, cholesterol gets in there as a repair mechanism and it sets off an inflammatory response. So inflammation becomes a marker of poor metabolic health. However, we also know that diseases that, you know, start with inflammation, things like autoimmune diseases, you know, which is basically in, in many cases, you know, what happens in autoimmune diseases is your body is reacting to something, you know, that's introduced from the environment. That can oftentimes be food, uh, that can be other triggers, you know, that get in from our environment. And it sets off this immune reaction, which, you know, an inflammatory reaction in our bodies. And that inflammation can then start to cause blood vessel damage. Uh, so, you know, it works both ways, uh, but ultimately you can't really separate out, uh, you know, metabolic health from inflammation. And so it's an important both marker of the disease process, and it's also a predictor of the disease process. Uh, and so I think it's something that we need to pay attention to. Now, again, one of the best ways to lower inflammation in your body is to stop eating foods that promote inflammation. And these foods are the processed foods. They promote inflammation in our body and therefore are, are damaging, you know, to our metabolic health. And I know you'll read, you know, you can go out there on, on you know, uh, the internet and you can find things that say, well, eating meat is inflammatory. Uh, eating eggs are inflammatory. But this is where the scientism, as you refer to it, comes into play. There simply is not good scientific evidence to support that. Uh, again, myself and many, many other people who are out there eating primarily, you know, meat and eggs, and my levels of inflammation are literally undetectable when you do the blood work. Uh, so 
Um, you know, that's just a fallacy that's out there. And the real inflammatory foods are the processed foods, uh, vegetable and seed oils, these highly processed uh, oils are the primary drivers of inflammation in our diet. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. What are the two or three things that, or one thing that gives you the blood marker for inflammation? What would that be? That you want yeah, to so the most it. common one we use is, is something called C-reactive protein or CRP. There's uh, a couple of Does others, that require but, the CT scan or is that, is that uh, the CT no, scan? No, no, it's a blood, yeah, blood test, very simple, inexpensive blood test. Again, ask your doctor to add it on your blood panel. You know, it's ironic. You were talking about the price of things before. And, uh, you know, the question oftentimes gets asked, well, why doesn't my doctor check my insulin level? And, you know, you'll hear, oh, it's so expensive. The reality is, is it, it's about an $8 test. Um, it yeah. is not expensive at all. C-reactive protein, again, very inexpensive test to add on to your panel. Most of the time, your insurance company will cover it. But even if they don't, you know, you might be paying 20 bucks for it at the most. Uh, right. So um, That's cheaper than yeah. a heart attack. Yeah, exactly. That, and again, you know, this is another concept that I think is important for people to understand. You might need to invest some money in your health. It may not be free. Some of these tests may not be covered by insurance. You might have to pay out of pocket for them. You might have to pay out of pocket to connect with a doctor, you know, to work with a doctor who's knowledgeable about this stuff because the insurance model really doesn't give doctors adequate time to go into these issues. You know, one of the things that drives, you know, why do we use so many prescriptions instead of talking to people about what they should be eating? It takes a minute to write a prescription. Uh, yeah. We've been talking an hour and a half here, uh, you know, about what to eat. And uh, so it takes more time to take this approach. And oftentimes the insurance model doesn't allow physicians to do that. So sometimes you're going to have to pay out of pocket to see the physicians who are paying attention to this stuff. But yeah, that is worth a worthwhile it. investment. Absolutely. I completely agree. And uh, I'll promote you. You're not promoting yourself, but you can go to ovadiahearthealth.com. I'll put a link to it and you can learn. He has a lot of things where you can learn more and you should get this book. Okay. So I've taken a lot of your time, but we don't need to get into the details of should you eat avocados or spinach or meat, but let's get to the big picture. You recommend seven things. And you've already talked about some of them. So one is just thinking health as a system and not a goal and realize that, you know, this is a long-term approach and you've already just talked about that. Get a good doctor, pay attention to your blood work and exercise your agency, right? And that goes to the second principle. And again, feel free to add anything. Eat real whole food. And so you, you've, we've talked about this before that we want to avoid the processed foods, stay on the outsides of the supermarket. And then you you go through the distinctions and people can read about keto and paleo and various things. And there's you know a lot of ways to think about this, but make sure that we're focused on, on eating real whole foods. And then you also talk about move and exercise. And so let's add anything you want on the food thing. I don't, you've said it. And again, I recommend this book because he goes through uh, a lot of different examples and what to eat and some, you know, things not to eat, et cetera. So, and some of it's obvious, right? Don't eat lots of chips and crackers and all those things. They're just bad for you. You talk about exercise and there's different kinds of ways of thinking, you know, zone two, zone three, cardio. And um, I actually have the X3 bar that you have. You mentioned the X3 Great. bar. Yep. The X3 bar for listeners is a, it's like a plate and then bands and there's like a little deadlifting bar and you can use a deadlift, shoulders, thing. And I, I got it right around, right before COVID started. I was on the plane and I was reading the, the his book. What's the name of his book? Leif, weightlifting is a waste of time. And of course, yep. it's a he's he's like really big and strong and weightlifts. And I was reading the book and he's explaining it and he's talking about like how you're putting pressure on the joints, but if you use the band, you can get more weight for muscle growth. And anyway, I was reading it and I was thinking to myself, he's gonna sell me something. I know he's going to sell me something and he sure did, <laughs> but yeah. I actually like it. I like it. It's a good workout and you can do it no, fast. It's an excellent it's system, but <laughs> yeah, you know, when, when it comes to activity, you know, I do think that building and maintaining muscle really should be our priority. Uh, and again, that why, has why a, is that? Can you explain that? Yeah, because, you know, muscle, first of all, is 
more metabolically active. It's the most metabolically active tissue we have, you know, outside of our brains and our heart. But, you know, you can build your muscle that is going to increase your metabolic rate. And it's going to be increasing your metabolic rate throughout the day, you know, while you're awake, while you're sleeping, while you're moving. Uh, as opposed to, you know, if you go to the gym and you do cardio, yeah, you'll burn some extra energy while you're doing that cardio, but it really doesn't do anything for you the rest of the day. The other important thing about muscle, it's another place that we can store energy. And so, uh, you know, and, and it, it, it takes priority over fat cells. So if you're storing the energy in your muscles and then you're using your muscles and burning that energy, and then your body's going to put more energy to replenish your muscles before it starts, you know, shoving that energy into fat cells. So having more muscle protects you against metabolic disease. And finally, you know, there is a very deep uh, body of scientific literature around the more muscle you have, the more muscle you're able to maintain as you get older, not only the longer you live, but the better quality of life that you're going to have. Uh, so that's why I, I really emphasize with people, you know, prioritize building muscle, building and maintaining muscle with resistance exercise. It can be body weight resistance exercise. It can be lifting weights. It can be, you know, uh, resistance bands like the X3 system. But prioritize building muscle first. And then if you want to spend the time doing the cardio, great. It has its own benefits, uh, but you got to get the muscle building first. Okay. And then you also talk about sleep and stress. You just yep. want to add onto that. How, why, why is sleep so important? Yeah. Well, sleep is, you know, when our body repairs itself. Uh, and again, it has a very intimate relationship with metabolic health. And similar to what we were talking about with inflammation, it's a two-way street. People who are metabolically unhealthy uh, get poorer quality sleep. And if you don't get enough quality sleep, it makes you more likely to be metabolically unhealthy. There are a lot of reasons that might be, but you know, ultimately, you know, getting enough quality sleep. Now, one of the things I talk about in the book that, again, might not be the way that most people understand it is it's not about the amount of sleep that you get. It's about the quality of sleep. And you need to get enough quality sleep uh, because there are plenty of people out there who are tired all the time and they're sleeping 10 and 12 hours a night, uh, but they're not getting quality sleep probably because of their poor underlying metabolic health. And so that's not going to be useful. And on the flip side, you know, one of the things I consistently hear from my patients and from people that improve their metabolic health is they say, you know, I sleep less, uh, but I sleep better and uh, I get better quality sleep. And so six or seven hours might be enough sleep for me because it's high quality sleep. Uh, so again, don't necessarily focus on the total amount of your sleep pay attention to the quality of the sleep that you're getting. Okay. Yeah. Like I find, for example, if I have any more than two drinks and it's closer to bedtime, I wake up like, and I, and, and I think yeah. there's a reason for it, right? At, at about four hours, like you get a, a jolt. So you really also, I think moderating alcohol use, but also don't have it before you go to bed really helps. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, you know, alcohol certainly impairs sleep. Uh, Having a high carbohydrate meal too close to your bedtime is going to negatively affect your sleep as well. Yeah. So, um, okay, you know, an, another reason to be avoiding uh, high carbohydrates. Right. Okay. So here's just a couple of quick questions. You talk about stress. You know, a lot of people uh, recommend things like cold therapy for stress, but also like people like Wim Hof argue that cold therapy, like taking like a very cold shower or an ice bath is also very good for cardiovascular health. What, what's your take on that as a heart surgeon? Um, yeah. So I would say, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, there is evidence that uh, cold therapy, cold exposure can be good for our metabolic health and our cardiovascular health. And there's also a lot of evidence that warm, you know, specifically sauna <laughs> is very good for our, um, cardiovascular health. Uh, so you can look at both sides of it. Ultimately, uh, you know, what I tell people is it's probably lower on the list. 
you got to get mm-hmm. the other stuff first, get your diet, you know, dialed in, make sure you're getting good sleep, you know, make sure you're getting enough activity. And then, you know, you can be paying attention to some of these other things. Uh, and, yeah. and there are lots of things on that list. But if you get down to that point that you're paying attention to those things, you're probably going to be doing okay. So there is evidence that, you know, things like cold exposure and sauna can both help with cardiovascular health. And I'm fully supportive of people who want to do one or both. And I think it's great to incorporate into your overall strategy, but don't make it the first thing. You know, if you're going out and cold plunging while you're still eating the processed food, you're probably not going to see a benefit from that. Right. It could be dangerous for you too. So uh, what do you think? Hey, one more quick question. What do you think about medium chain triglycerides, MCT oil? Like it, this is people part of this in the, in the keto diet. You talk like, you know, you put cream and butter and, and MCT yeah. oil and coffee. It's a lot of calories. It's fat. It doesn't affect your insulin. What do you think as long-term that if it's a little shocking to people that people would use that? What's your take on that? Yeah, so I, I think they can be a, a good tool, especially when you're sort of adapting to, uh, you know, a low carbohydrate diet. You know, our bodies are able to tap into the energy from them. And again, if you have too much body fat, at some point, you know, you want your body to start burning that fat for energy instead of fat that you're taking in. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's going to be contextual. So again, I yeah. oftentimes will use that as a tool to help people as they're making this adaptation. And then at some point you want to start kind of dialing it back because your body's going to burn that before it's going to start burning your own body fat. And ultimately you do want it to start burning its own body fat. But, you know, it's interesting, again, going back to this saturated fat discussion, coconut oil, which is what MCT oil comes from, uh, coconut oil actually has the highest percentage of saturated fat of really any fat source that we consume way more than red meat does. And yet, you know, in the whole saturated fat discussion, coconut oil is, uh, is almost universally recognized as a, a healthful food to be eating. And then in the same sentence, those people will tell you, but you can't eat red meat because of the saturated fat. Uh, so Do you it, think that's it, because it, coconut oil doesn't have cholesterol? You think that's well, you know, that's uh, I guess part of the mental gymnastics that people play yeah. around this issue. But yeah, the reality is, is, is uh, I don't, I don't think either is harmful for you. You know, I think it's just fine to be consuming coconut oil. Um, I prefer the animal fats, quite honestly. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, but uh, coconut oil, I don't really have any problem with people consuming that. Okay, and then you mentioned the negatives of seed oils. You said those are yep. a problem. Uh, can just a quick primer on why what are seed oils and why do you avoid them? Yeah, so seed oils are uh, highly processed uh, oils, uh, and these are things like you know uh, canola oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, peanut oil, the vegetable oils they'll, they'll oftentimes be called, even though they're really not made from vegetables. Uh, palm marketing oil, term. Right. Yeah, palm oil is another one, but not olive um, oil. Correct. So not olive oil, not coconut oil, and not avocado oil, which all come from the fruit. They don't come from the seed. Uh, And the problem is to get these oils from the seeds, you need to put them through very intensive processing. A lot of, you know, chemical processes to get them out and then to make them palatable uh, to human beings. Realize that these were first developed as industrial lubricants. And then someone figured out that we can detoxify them enough uh, that they won't kill people immediately when they eat them. Yeah, exactly. No, it's really, if you look at, there are some YouTube videos out there that go through the process of what it actually takes to make these things. And anyone that watches the videos would never think to put these things in their bodies uh, anymore. So, But the problem is uh, that these oils, our body isn't able to properly metabolize them, isn't able to properly break them down. And so they substitute for, again, the saturated fats that we have evolved to eat. Uh, They get into things like our cell membranes. And again, they have a different structure, uh, so they can be damaging there. And then more importantly, probably, is that they get into the mitochondria, the energy 
you know, the mm-hmm. engines that create the energy for our uh, cells and our existence. And again, they're not properly broken down. They're not properly metabolized. They become toxic to that system. There's always a debate that goes on. You know, so when I say to people, don't eat processed food, and they say, well, what is it in the processed food? And you can look at the sugar and the processed carbohydrates, and you can look at the vegetable and seed oils that are components of all processed food. And you can argue, okay, which one is worse or which one is it? And ultimately, I say it probably doesn't matter. Just avoid the processed food and you don't get vegetable and seed oils in your diet really outside of processed food. So that that's my take on that. It's great. Yeah, thanks. I know you mentioned mitochondria and I you've talked about how, you know, it's this goes all the way down to the cellular level. And so this yep. is why metabolic health is super important. It's not just simply like for your heart, it's for it's all the way down to the cellular level, all to the mi- mitochondria, et cetera. So, um, okay. One other last question for you. What do you think about fake meat? And I'm going to say, I think it's the worst idea ever. Yeah. Well, so y- you, you can know, disagree with me. Again, I just like, Bill Gates, yeah, fake no. meat. I mean, oh my goodness, what a disaster. But yeah. Feel so free to in the context <laughs> in the context of what we've been talking about in this processed food and, you know, making our food more and more processed. And I agree, fake meat is like the ultimate level of that. Uh, and it really is, uh, you know, I think the worst idea that we have come up with. Nothing in this is anywhere close to natural. And, and you know, I also just find it kind of ironic that, you know, why do we need this? Uh, why did anyone think this is a good idea? And it goes back to the false narrative that, you know, meat is harmful for us. But, you know, so it, it, it becomes and again, this is where that institutional, uh, you know, capture and that group think and all of that comes into play that we have to, you know. So if you were to believe that meat is bad for you, then just eliminate meat from your diet. Like, why would you need a substitute for it? And then why we're going to then go to the extreme of creating this highly, you know, chemical slop, which is all that it is, to then substitute for the meat uh, is just an insane idea. Thankfully, you know, again, this is where the free will, the market is speaking. Uh, you know, we all know that the, these companies uh, have just been uh, tanking and no one's buying this stuff. You know, it's interesting because, you know, obviously, the people who, you know, in my community who believe meat to be healthful would have no reason to ever buy this stuff. A lot of the vegan community, the whole food plant-based community, you know, that is really doing veganism for the health aspects of it, as opposed to some of the other reasons that people do veganism, they won't eat that stuff because they recognize it as highly processed garbage. Uh, and, and so, you know, who is who is actually buying this stuff? And the real answer is no one is. So quick story, I travel a lot, you know, I'm on planes oftentimes. And uh, for quite a while, the airlines, uh, you know, were pushing, you know, they always had the the fake meat alternative is one of the meal options, you know, when you're on the plane and invariably it would be the last thing, you know, you would get to kind of the back rows and the, the stewardess would just be saying, you know, that's all we have left. That's the only other option. And every, exactly. almost universally, everyone would say, well, I'll just not eat, you know? That's so, right. um, well, it, this it, is important. Yeah, actually. I agree with you. It really is a bad idea. And I think the people are aware of that. Well, I hope so. And I mean, okay, this is me being a little bit partisanly because I've done work, poverty industry stuff. But here's the, it's interesting. Uh, The back row is, I think, a good image. So I interviewed a guy called Chris Arnotti, who wrote a book called Dignity about like about back row and front row America. Very interesting. And, um, you know, the back row, who's going to get the fake meat? It's going to get into schools probably poor schools. I know I'm being speculative. Okay. So I don't have evidence, but I mean, like I wouldn't be surprised, right? It's going to get into poor schools. It's going to be used with the government, with subsidized companies, getting it into, you know, union controlled, teacher union controlled public schools, but not to the rich schools, right? Except for a couple of them who are like, you know, fashionably want to be vegan. They'll, they'll have that option, which the children won't like, and then it'll get sent to the poor school. So that's my very cynical thing of what's going to happen with fake meat. I mean, I think it's a total disaster. And 
this is actually the, really a deep connection into the moral imagination theme of this podcast is that, as you said, right, why do we think meat's bad for us is a real question. Why do we think cows are bad for the environment? Real question, right? Well, we're just going to forget that. We're just going to assume they're bad for us. And then we're going to make a fake meat substitute uh, that no one's going to want. And it's, I think it's just shows you a certain type of um, uh, what you know, C.S. Lewis wrote in The Abolition of Man that we've lost a sense of our patrimony. We've come to this sense of like hyper scientific way of thinking uh, that kind of misses the reality of the given in front of us. And so anyway, so I think fake meat is, I think it's a whole other discussion, but I'm very negative about it. Yeah, no, definitely. It uh, really is the highest level of problem thinking. It's trying to solve a problem that never existed in the first place. And, exactly. uh, you know, we could probably point to many societal examples of this, but I think, you know, kind of summarizing, you know, what we've been dis discussing, a lot of our issues around health kind of come from that. You know, we, we've created our own problems and then we think that the, the solution to those problems is kind of doing things harder, uh, doing more of those things that led to the problems, you know, occurring in the first place. Yeah, like hyper technocratic kind of solutions to problems. Well, uh, Dr. Philip Ovedia, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. I know I took a lot of your time. It's uh, you got a mixture of of science, medicine, and philosophy here. So I'm I'm really grateful for you taking time uh, to talk to me. And I will put links, listeners, to his book and to the other books that that we discussed and some articles. And uh, you can follow him uh, on Twitter. At let's see, what what are you on Twitter? Your uh, I fix hearts on Twitter. I fix hearts yeah. on Twitter. And also yeah. you can uh, find him at ovadiahearthealth.com. But again, I'll put all those links at themoralimagination.com. So thanks for listening. And thank you, Dr. Ovedia, for taking the time to talk to me. Thanks, Michael. <laughs>